When we think of big infrastructure projects, the conversation mostly revolves around funding, cost, design, and what policy objectives they meet. All important issues, but potentially secondary if we don't have the skilled workforce to roll up their sleeves and build it. With us now on why that could be an issue going forward in this province and what to do about it, we welcome Aaron Corey, President and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario. Jan De Silva, President and CEO, Toronto Region Board of Trade. Andy Manahan, Executive Director at RCCAO, the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario. And Sharina Hussain, Assistant Professor in Brookfield Centre Real Estate and Infrastructure at York University's Schulich School of Business. And it's great to have everybody around our table tonight for this, uh, I think, very timely conversation. We want to just start by showing, here's a list of the priorities that the Ontario government has when it comes to building infrastructure in the province. Sheldon, you want to put this graphic up? And for those listening on podcast, I will read this out because this is big. 371 childcare projects, more than 2,000 community projects, nearly 1,900 education projects, 65 healthcare projects, more than 1,000 northern projects, nearly 100 recreation projects, more than 320 roads and bridges projects, and 220 transit projects. Jan, that is a very big to-do list. And even beyond the issue of whether or not we've got all the money to pay for all these things, does the industry, in your view, even have the capacity, the people power, to get these projects built on time and on budget? We absolutely do not. And this has been a topic we've been paying a very, very close attention to through our construction members since 2016. We actually did a report back in 2016 trying to forecast the talent gap in construction. And we found that we needed 146,000 workers in construction. That's a generation of jobs. 27,000 of those were replacing retirements, 119,000 net new jobs. And that's just for the infrastructure projects that have been announced up to 2016. Since then, we've had Ontario Line and a number of other major projects added to the list. 146,000 jobs is what we need? How many that do we was have? Just, oh, this is net new. These are net, net new jobs new. Beyond, what we have. beyond what we have. The other <laughs> very, very scary stat, over the next decade, almost 22% of people in construction in Ontario will be retiring, one-fifth of the workforce. That's even before you overlay the work that's required. Sounds like a perfect storm. And Aaron's nodding. He knows as well. Well, <laughs> let's find out uh, about this from Aaron. First of all, your infrastructure in Ontario, just give us a sense about what you guys do. Sure. So our agency was set up about 15 years ago by the province to provide consistency to all the infrastructure projects across transit and road building, hospitals, education, act as, uh, in a sense, in essence, uh, project managers for the province in delivering the largest of their infrastructure projects. Have you got a good guess about how many billions of dollars of works you've got on your to-do list right now? Right now, we have $64 billion worth of work, either in, con in construction, in bidding, or in the planning stage. As Jan said, that, it, that encompasses the large transit projects, the subway build and extensions, a number of large highway projects, significant build-out of our healthcare system. Um, where we're still investing as we have been for the last decade or so. Do you share Jen's terror about the possibility of getting it all done on time and on budget? I think it's really important for us to make long-term sustained investment in infrastructure. What has happened historically is we've gone through waves. Build, stop, build, stop. And that has a whole bunch of negative implications. One of them is on workforce. It makes it hard for people to plan a career in the trades when you jump, when it's boom and bust cycles. And I think what we've done better in the last 10 or 15 years is have a more sustained program of build. And if you look forward, that's what we've tried to lay out even more and to try and stage it in a way that has that work coming. Because this is generational. The investments I talk about, you don't spend $64 billion overnight. You have to plan it well and do it in a sustained way. And that allows people to plan their careers and train knowing that there's a long-term flow of work. So. Not too many weeks ago, on this side of the table, we had on a guy you know well, Phil Verster mm -hmm. from Metrolinx, who's responsible, of course, for putting all the transit together that you're responsible for getting built on time and on budget. Here's what he had to say about all of this, okay? Sheldon, the clip, if you would. Are the current projects that are on book and planned, in your view, adequate to what's coming down the pike? So, such a great question. Are they adequate themselves? No, they're not. We, have, we are catching up with many different years, many years of backlog. 
They are a fantastic start. And I've got to be honest with you, it's about as much as what the market can sustain. The infrastructure market worldwide is extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. And we have a real challenge to attract the right bidders, the right infrastructure, the right knowledge, the right expertise to the region to come and build it. What has to happen is that this great start that we have currently with the four subway projects and go must be maintained in the next, year, next eight, nine, ten years to come. Sharita, let me follow up with you. You heard Phil say what the mission is. Do you think we've got in place right now what we need to make sure that that momentum continues 8, 9, 10, 12, 15 years down the road. I think we have the right bones in place. Now is the idea in order to feed it, to make sure that the, the momentum continues, but not just that, but to make sure that we're learning from the experiences, the projects that have just recently been completed, and then ultimately continuously innovate in order to ensure that we are going to meet those that very ambitious mandate that Phil just mentioned. And I say this from a variety of different perspectives. Um, yes, we're going to talk about the issues associated with getting skills trades into the um, to to actually construct these projects. But there's also an operation and management consideration that goes over the long-term life cycle of these assets. And that is very much the big unknown at this juncture. But in many ways, if you or I would get into a subway system, we want to ensure that it's going to be reliable, safe, and get us to where we need to be. Well, to that end, um, all right, you've heard the challenge afoot. The Ontario line, which is this new multi-billion dollar subway line, supposed to start at the Science Centre and go all the way down to Ontario Place in Toronto. Supposed to be done in seven years. Given what you know about all of what we've talked about here so far, is that feasible? I think a lot's going to need to happen right now in order to ensure that we have the capabilities to deliver in seven years. At least when it comes to being able to have the first phases of that Ontario line up and running. And yes, there is the issue associated with capacity, we're associated with having the skilled trades, but also ensuring that the bidders in the project have the capabilities in-house when it comes to project management expertise in order to deliver such a high-profile project within such a tight time frame. Mm. This goes back to the issue of continuously learning from the previous experiences just to ensure Sure that whatever mistakes may have happened in the past are not replicated to ensure that we get very close to that seven-year time frame. Yeah. Andy, what's your view on whether industry can handle what's on the to-do list of the province today? In the past, we've demonstrated that we are able to uh, rise to the occasion. I'll give you one example going back to the 1990s. The um, recession uh, resulted in uh, a very low level of housing starts. I think the lowest level was about 35,000 in 1995. Right now, we're pumping out 73, 75,000 per year across the province. Hmm. We were able to redeploy workers who were traditionally in the residential sector to work on Highway 407. But because housing's so strong right now, we don't have the luxury of that redeployment option. So we really do need to look at pulling out all the stops. Uh, we'll talk about this later, I'm sure. But you know, how do we recruit young people to tell them about the great opportunities that are in the construction Just sector? Just a quick follow up on that, uh, mm -hmm. and forgive my ignorance on this, but. Are the skills that transferable that if you know how to build a house, you can necessarily know how to build a highway? Certain ones like asphalt raking and so forth. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm with a labor management organization. So uh, we have training centers. So, so beyond colleges where a lot of the skilled trades do learn their craft, uh, there are training centers where very specific skills can be taught in a short time. In addition, you know, health and safety and everything else. So it can be done. Gotcha. Jan, I want to talk to you about politics for a second in this regard. Uh, we had an election a year and a half ago in the province of Ontario, change of government. If you look over the last 30 years, we had new Democrats, then Conservatives, then Liberals, then Conservatives again. It's been a lot of switching back and forth. What does business think about the unpredictability of a new agenda every time a new party comes into power? Well, certainly uh, political risk of change is going to be a factor. I'm sure Aaron and Infrastructure Ontario are having to deal with this in terms of the P3 market. You need to have certainty. It takes a lot of money, a lot of effort to go through the bidding process and then to have something pulled and not proceed. So there's economic implications for our members. Uh, what we would point to is other jurisdictions around the world, in Europe and Australia, where there's mega projects. I'd argue the Ontario line is an example of a mega project. It's just so uh, demonstrably needed that those governments put in place multi-year funding commitments that fall outside election cycles, so you can't have a lot of that toing and froing as a result of campaigns. But I think with the backlog of needed infrastructure that we have in the region and in the province, I think uh, political parties hopefully will feel a lot of pressure if they try to to unpack projects that have already been started. Aaron, they haven't in the past. I mean, if you look at the Scarborough subway, it's had four or five different incarnations. So how, how does Infrastructure Ontario 
roll with all of those different political punches. It's interesting, Steve. If you look around the world, actually, I don't think we fully recognize the reputation that Ontario, that Canada, and in particular Ontario, has as a stable, trustworthy, consistent market. And over the last nearly 20 years now, we have had a sustained program of build, and it's cut across political parties and election cycles. And I think that's because, as a society, I say this apolitically, but I think we've realized that we have some catching up to do. I think all levels of government, municipal, provincial, where I work, and federal, across all parties, know the need. And I think because of that, we've done some of the things Jan has said. We have created for the market an expectation and a pretty consistent pattern of behavior. Other parts around the world go through much more whipsawing when elect states, in the, you see it in the United States, in many individual states, you see it around the world. And we actually have built a reputation as a place that follows through and builds. So there are obviously, a project goes through a life cycle. So there are always in the planning stage adjustments to pro any individual project, but actually we have a great track record of seeing things through and carrying through to completion. Well, can I? I'd like okay, to Jen, I, I, as well. Okay, I know everybody else wants to get on that. Go ahead, Eddie, you start and then Jen. Okay. Sure, I mean, there have been examples right out of the gate where the Ford government has either scaled back or canceled projects. I think the biggest one that's under the radar is the missing link. This was to separate uh, freight traffic from passenger rail. Uh, going west of Mississauga towards Milton. That was a $5 billion project, so I can understand it was an eye popper in terms of the government, in terms of trying to deal with it. Um, but another one that I'm sure if, if Hazel McCallion were still on the Metrolinks board, she would have given uh, Phil Verster a, a tongue lashing with respect to, you've taken out the loop around my square one, which is the hub of Mississauga, how dare you? And she would have had scorch lines up University <laughs> Avenue to talk to people at Queen's Park saying, if you guys really believe in transit-oriented development, why have you taken out this loop? And why haven't you come to us earlier to talk about options? Jen? Yeah. And I would say, uh, I agree, we, we applaud Infrastructure Ontario, you do tremendous work. The difference that we're seeing, and again, I go back to mega projects. We had Sir Terry Morgan, who was the former chairman of Crossrail in the UK. He talked about when they embarked on that project, 40 stations had to be built across a uh, major swath of, of the city they looked at the talent they were going to need to get it built. And there was a lot of burrowing, a lot of tunnels that needed to be put in place. Uh, they recognized they'd need about 1,200 engineers with that capability. There was only 750 in all of the UK, and they were working on other projects. So one of the mandates they did with that procurement process was required that anyone building, bidding for any part of that project uh, up to the tune of 3 billion euros or more, 3 billion pounds rather, or more, would have to have an apprentice working. So the goal was to build out 1,200 apprenticeships, and they were successful in doing that over the project. So it's the, the need to kind of build in to the uh, procurement process, what is the talent you need, and how do you get those successful bidders to build that talent base for you? Okay, Aaron, I'm going to push back a bit on what you just yeah. had to say, because uh, maybe compared to the rest of the world, we don't whipsaw as much, but as I indicated before, five different incarnations for the Scarborough subway. We've had gas plants canceled uh, at the last minute. We have had the Hamilton LRT just a few weeks ago canceled. Uh, wind turbines, which contracts were let, all of a sudden canceled. Uh, this is all, I mean, if you add it all up, we're talking hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of canceled contracts. How is industry supposed to figure all that out exactly? Well, our, our job, the, the role we play in trying to bridge between public and private sector is to address exactly that kind of challenge, Steve. And so the way we do that is through things like publishing a market pipeline and every quarter. So you're right, projects do come and go. Mm -hmm. But we're really transparent about that as a jurisdiction and we give signals to the market as early as we make decisions. And so what that allows bidders to do and allows workforces to do is start to plan. So you could go on the province's website today and you could see when are they planning on releasing the next 17 hospital projects and the next 10 transit projects, when they're meant, meant to come to market, how they're meant to be delivered. And that does give the market time to organize itself, form teams, plan for where it's gonna find labor, as Jan said. Obviously, as I say, there are gonna be changes in that list as we move forward, as priorities of the day change, but we actually have done a good job of helping industry see that wave that's coming, because Jan talked about those numbers. We, are, we need to help everyone start mm -hmm. from a position of transparency. When are projects coming? What are the skills gonna be required? What are the specific trades those are gonna need so that people can start to invest? Sharina, in your view, are we as transparent and predictable as Infrastructure Ontario would have us believe. 
In relative terms, there is quite a lot of transparency as it in terms of the pipeline of projects that are coming our way. I think it's important for us to step back and recognize that infrastructure inherently has a public dimension. And that includes the idea of meeting the priorities of individuals or the stakeholders who are otherwise most affected by that infrastructure project or the planned projects. For that reason, whenever there is in fact a change in government, they are in fact reflecting some of the different priorities that may be speaking to their constituents, not just here in Ontario, but also globally across the board. That being said, when you think of the perspective of industry and how they're supposed to manage their businesses, that's a degree of political uncertainty. And I would argue that there's always going to be that degree of political uncertainty. The question, of course, is whether or not there's a program of projects on the horizon in order to allow large organizations or a possibly even skilled trades who are considering whether to build their careers that encompasses infrastructure in some shape or form to have some degree of knowledge that there will be opportunities for them to grow their career, have some resiliency built into it, otherwise than being tied to one project which may or may not necessarily survive a political cycle. And that's the angle I want to follow up on now because we're going to put up another chart with some more numbers here. We've got a survey of the Ontario Construction Secretariat. This was released last year. That secretariat incidentally represents the interests of unionized constructive, uh, construction industry rather, in Ontario's industrial, commercial, and institutional construction sector. It's a joint labor management organization. People were asked, what are your biggest problems right now? Sheldon, bring the chart up and we'll show everybody what people said. 72% said recruiting skilled workers is the biggest problem they have. 72%, almost three out of four. Half said an aging workforce is the biggest problem. 34% said the provincial political environment. Okay, it's only a third. Uh, three out of 10 said keeping up with new technologies. Another three out of 10 said changes to NAFTA or the new US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. And one out of five, 19% said government community benefits expectations. I need actually a definition on that. Andy, what are community benefits expectations? Uh, a number of years ago, the province implemented what they call the community benefits framework. So, for example, with the Eglinton Crosstown LRT just up the road here, uh, there was a recognition that it was going through a certain number of neighbourhoods and we wanted um, uh, young workers from those neighbourhoods to be part of the construction crews. So our union side has been very supportive in terms of trying to deal with that because it's one other tool in the toolkit to try to get more young people um, on sites. I, I just want to uh, mention though, uh, in terms of a, a, a stat, in terms of what our contractor members have been talking about, the average age right now in construction is 55. Now that varies by sector, but we will have a wave of retirements as Jan was uh, yeah. referencing to uh, by the end of this decade, which will be very difficult to uh, uh, meet, the, meet the gap. Jen, are okay. we replacing the retirees as quickly as we need to? No, and if I could just respond on community benefit uh, expectations, I think this was a wonderful idea, but what we hear from our members, it's really, it, it's been proving difficult to really get, uh, get the local community engaged in those jobs. What we've been trying to have discussions with is looking at where we've got projects in a certain jurisdiction, say around the airport, and can we create a talent development zone there where we expand uh, trades programs at Humber University, and that anyone who bids on those projects has a mandate to require talent, higher talent out of Humber. And what our construction members are telling us is if they know that going in, they'll sit down with Humber College to work on the programming. Some of them have even said, why don't we look at a co-op so that students, rather than doing two years full-time at school, six months in, six months on the job, it's easier with the journeyman apprentice model and it also is a way of helping those young workers get uh, paid while they're going to school. Okay, but let me do a little follow-up here. If, if you're building a new highway in Northern Ontario, my hunch is people in Northern Ontario want those highway jobs, those highway construction jobs, uh, not to come from people in Toronto, but from people who live north of the French River. Oh, I, I would fully agree. But what we're saying is for those jobs that are taking place around the airport, let's build the talent right in that location. So you're not having people commuting in from other parts of the province to take on those jobs. It's how do you look at where the jobs are going to be required and how do you build the talent pool around them? And I agree with Serena, rather than tying it to just one project, if there's multiple projects happening in that jurisdiction, it's a generation of work, you know, depending on as they get sequenced. You want to By make the a way, list? With, uh, uh, with Northern Ontario, we really do need to do a lot more with the respect of Indigenous communities as well. Mm -hmm. They need to benefit from these projects yeah. and sometimes they're uh, forgotten about. You want to make a list? What do we need right now? What jobs? I've got some right here. Um, elevator uh, technicians, uh, a dramatic shortage, um, uh, high-rise forming crews, uh, dire need right now. Um, I've heard stories about certain uh, uh, 
uh, crane operators. These are the, you know, the high rises that we build in Toronto. Then in some cases, and probably not the best for safety, but they may be working on one job site in the morning and then working on a, a different job site later in the day. That's not mm. sustainable, but it, it does happen. And our data on who's retiring within mm. the next decade, it tends to be welders, framers, and finishers. Yeah. Mm. So. so if you are in grade 11 or 12 right now and you want to pretty much be sure yeah. of having a sustained, well-remunerated career, pick one of those jobs. Is that the idea? Yeah. We um, also work with industry and Andy mm -hmm. and associations like his looking at this as we go out. And of course, we try to lay layer in all the provincial infrastructure projects, the ones we've been talking about, but also there are the reinvestments in our nuclear power infrastructure. Yeah. There's the all the cranes and the private construction going on, especially in the GTHA. When we look at that, the most recent work we did, which was late last year, um, shows that the, the peak, when all of these projects are into the height of their construction, is coming in about the mid-2020s, 2025, 2026. At that mm -hmm. point, we'll have the Ontario line and the extensions to the Scarborough and line one happening and Eglinton West um, will have hospitals underway and those projects in the energy and other sectors going on. So the good news of that is we, we're we in a window where we do if we act and we in a coordinated way and the province has made changes to things like apprenticeship ratios mm -hmm. to try and mm -hmm. make it easier to get apprentices onto job sites. Jan mentioned this and I think it's really important. Um, five or six years is, is going to go very fast. Mm -hmm. But we are at a time now where we can start building that workforce. I, I just want to add, though, the, the list Andy made is, is great, and, and Jan added too, and we see the same gaps. But I want to point out that skilled trades is one, but the other areas we need to think about are project management and mm -hmm. site expertise, and that one's a harder one to fill. Those are people who right now would be in their 40s. They've been mm -hmm. wor done work as a trades. They would have started 20 years ago, and they're now ready to be site superintendents or foremen. Estimators. Estimators. Mm -hmm. So some of those jobs, that's a bit trickier because that started with training. And so for that, I think we do have to come up with ideas that are partnerships, education, private sector, that allow us to, to do rapid training, do co-ops or that mid-career forms of training where people can get upskilled to play those roles because those mm -hmm. will be gaps for us too. Mm -hmm. Sharina, I saw the uh, Premier of Ontario just the other day along with the Mayor of Brampton hold a... Uh, public press conference in which he said we're going to put a new hospital in Brampton. What happens a few years down the road when it comes time to building that thing and they don't have enough skilled workers to build it? What do they do? I think it's one of two things. You either consider paying a bit more of a premium in order to try to recruit more of those skilled laborers to divert their attention from other projects and consider working on that new hospital. So we got to poach other people? Is that the idea? Quite possibly. Our or, union members don't like that approach. They, well, <laughs> it's, it's one, one approach. may not be the best one. Or is it the idea of being able to foresee what can be coming down the pipeline and listen to perhaps potential bidders who might say we don't have enough skilled workforces to be able to redirect skills to this project versus another and be able to then put a lot more attention on what are those apprenticeship programs? What about um, trying to get... Um, individuals to the pipeline sooner rather than later on the basis that this is foreseeable to the extent possible. Mm. I think this is a, the start of a lot of momentum building around reconsidering the trades. And you have to remember, this is a generational gap because many p parents, maybe 10, 15 years ago, did not want their children to consider I know. Trades. Everybody wants Johnny and Cheney to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Or that's, a journalist. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> but yeah, that's the problem. We need, yeah. we need people to, yeah. we need parents to say to their kids now, you can make a great living and have a great life doing all of the things we've talked about here. If I can just well, jump in on the remuneration yeah. side, uh, a little, uh, the pay is fantastic and there's lots of examples of, you know, people starting, uh, you know, close to 100,000 and, and plus. Uh, but we had done some survey work through uh, job talks. It was about 480 people uh, that were involved with a 30 minute survey. And what we found was that the job satisfaction uh, was just as important. So for example, um, the fulfillment of people in construction, they said 47% were compared to the general total population in the workforce was only 27%. Huh. So people are really happy in construction. It tests your mind. There's a, a team atmosphere. Uh, you see oh, you the results of your exactly. project. Exactly, you get something yeah. to show for it at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. Precisely. But, and I was just going to say, with all the attention today on the future of work and uh, on the negative side of technology disrupting things, the data we're looking at is saying over the next decade, 40% of the new jobs created in Ontario 
are going to be in construction. Right. Hmm. So the more we can do to help the general public understand this trend, the other piece that we haven't talked about is the role that skilled immigration could play as well mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. backfilling for some of those jobs that are just going to take time to okay. fill. Well, I was going to say that. Where do, I know you don't like this word, but when we do have to poach workers from other places, where do we get them from? There's lots of lots of talent that's coming. Well, I would argue we could start in Canada, offering more mobility, but that's a story for another day. But uh, but also there's a lot of, of countries around the world where people are working in uh, skilled trades that just coming over here, they're having to go back in and recertify. And so there's got to be a faster path that's being created for them to come in if they're coming in from Europe. Not only is uh, Toronto kind of a melting pot or you know immigrants in general, but uh, our workforce is essentially a UN. Um, I've been involved dealing with uh, several federal immigration ministers over the years, and sometimes because of the point system that we have, those workers don't have, let's say, the necessary academic credentials, but they know how to work on a construction site. So those are called undocumented workers, and we've had, they don't like the A word, you know, uh, but amnesty. So we encourage the federal minister to say, look, they're here, they're paying their taxes, we desperately need them, we'd like them to stay, give them a, you know, residency status. Is that happening? It's going to happen again. Hmm. Yeah. Steve, I think the other thing we're, we, we need to think more about is how do we do this work differently? Because, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. We're, you asked earlier about the Ontario line in getting built in seven years, and that's ambitious. It, it, we, we fully agree. Ambitious is a nice way of saying not going to happen. We, it's ambitious. <laughs> and we think for it to happen, we have to behave differently. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what I mean is be more efficient in the way we work have, if, if our processes are aligned, if permits come quicker and work can happen, if workers are more productive, projects get done faster and that workforce is able to work on more stuff. It increases our capacity. I think technology also has a huge role to play in the way we do construction. Construction is a very slow to change industry in the way we build things. We haven't innovated and I think there is a lot coming. Jan talked about the way work is changing, including in the way we build things, the way we use modeling and, and planning and technology to be more efficient on site, will help projects get done faster, which is a benefit of all society, but that also has the benefit of allowing skilled trades, the same number of people to get more built. Do we have an issue around certification here, meaning that if we need to get people from other places in the world or other provinces, they may not be quote unquote Ontario certified to work here? It, it's not my area of expertise, I'll defer to Andy, but I'll just say this, we have to always uh, balance juggle lots of things at once. I think safety is incredibly mm -hmm. important and quality is incredibly important. Whatever we build, this is infrastructure that lasts for 100 years. And so we need to do it right. So I think we can't ever skimp or shortchange ourselves on permitting and approvals and quality assessments and training of our workforce. So uh, I think it's important that work workers are highly skilled and ready to go. But, I, but I'm sure there are people from all over the world, as Jan said, who could come and do that in our jurisdiction and mm -hmm. we're open for mm -hmm. them. Andy, want to follow on that? Uh, I think uh, absolutely right. Um, there's also interprovincial migration. So when things slow down in Alberta, those workers may come to Ontario. I don't think we've, we've probably tapped that for what it's worth. Um, but East Coast, et cetera, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. So I think um, one, one point I wanted to make though, I would hate to have uh, any government say that because we don't have enough uh, skilled trades, we're gonna slow down, um, you know, the, the pipeline of projects because then you get into this unpredictability again that um, Shireen was talking about earlier. And, mm -hmm. and so I think probably a more important issue and, and you touched upon it right at the top, Steve, was um, funding. So for example, uh, a number of premiers have kicked this can down the road. Metrolinx came out with an investment strategy in 2013, but in fact, it was supposed to have been in the big move in 2008, and that chapter was basically ripped to shreds. They didn't want it to see the light of day. Kathleen Wynne uh, asked a transit panel to look at the investment strategy. I was on that panel. Uh, we wasted three months uh, because an election was coming in 2014 and politicians are scared of bringing in new taxes. Yeah. And we, we've seen it um, uh, right now. So in the campaign in 2018 with uh, Doug Ford, he said, I'm going to lower gas taxes. Part of that was cap and trade, but the 4.3 cents didn't sound scintillating enough. So the policy wonks, 30 year old said, we're going to make that 10 cents. The 5.7 cents hasn't come off yet. You know why? because municipalities said, by the by, that gas tax mm -hmm. revenue yeah. funds a lot of our municipal infrastructure. So we do have 
kind of disjointed policy uh, approaches. Hmm. Sharina, let me just, uh, let me give you the last word here on something that we just touched on briefly, but I think, uh, let me spend another minute on it here. The Ontario government recently took out an ad campaign trying to get people to reconsider the value of going into the trades. I know Andy's organization has done the same thing. What's your expectation of how successful those strategies can be to get high school students, college students mm -hmm. to rethink what they want to do with their futures? I think it's a step in the right direction, particularly when it comes to dealing with the, the otherwise known as a stigma associated with considering a career in the trades, at least as has been taught to a lot of these young people from their parents or their aunts and uncles or even from their grandparents. So I think it's the step in the right direction in that regard, but I think it's one piece in the puzzle. Um, you have to remember a lot of these young people don't necessarily use the same social media channels, so you might have to consider others such as TikTok or what have you, <laughs> maybe using influencers or other form of social media. But leaving that aside, there's a recognition amongst many um, young people that there's a, the jobs of, that are here today won't necessarily be the jobs that are going to be there in 20, 30 years from now. There's a lot of shifting that's happening. And will we build, will we construct the same highway system today, 20, 30 years from now? So for an individual who's contemplating a career in the trades, they also think about, will my job be automated? What do mm. I have to do today in order to have the skills to be successful over the next 30, 35, 40 years of my long-term career? So for that reason, I think it's part of a broader process of rethinking what skills, in addition to the specialized knowledge, needs to be learned by the youth in Ontario to be ready for such a career. That's the last word tonight. Can I have a nice wide shot, Mr. Director? There we go. Thanks, everybody, for coming into our studio tonight. Thank you. Helping us out with this. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.